So welcome back. It is the last week of finite for us. Uh, still a lot to be done in the short amount of time we have. So let's finish strong. So the whole the whole thing ends on the 30th. Okay? So everything is due on the 30th. And after the 30th at 11.59 PM, that's it. That's the end. No late work, nothing to be turned in, that's it. And then hopefully I can get grades done on uh, the 31st, calculated as best I can. When we, I plan on going through everyone's final exam, every question. This isn't the only class I'm teaching. I'm just like you, I, I'm also distracted by other things, um, but this is my only class, but I hope to go through every single person's every question and give as much partial credit as I possibly can. Like I tried to do with the midterm, I tried to go through it and see what's going on um, and give you some. So that may be full credit or that may be, you know, some quarter credit or something for a month. But that's very time consuming. Uh, but I will, I'll try to do it for everybody. And I think grades to be in by the first so you'll have your grade by the second okay if you're i'll just go ahead and tell you this i'm sure somebody's going to email me but um, i your grades will not me grading as fast as i possibly can will not change the length of time it takes for the transfer okay so me getting it done at 10 a.m on the 31st does not change how long it takes to get to IU, just a warning, okay? So that speed will be, um, as far as the college goes, not me. So it has to be in, the semester has to be ended, and then it transfers, okay? So I don't handle the transfer. I know most people are against students in this course, so you'll have to deal with the college as far as what it shows up on your transcript and all that it has nothing to do with me. The other thing I have to do is just grade it, and submit it to the college. That's the only thing. So just, I know that most people are guest students and they might need that grade as soon as possible. Um, just let you know, I'm not going to be the one that's, it, you won't be waiting for me. I have to, I have pretty much 24 hour turnaround with the grades. All right. Okay. So that being said, everything is due the 30th because that's the last moment of the Semester. So 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, wherever you are, still do uh, Eastern Standard Time. When that server in Indianapolis hits 11.59 p.m., that's it. Okay, that's the end, end of the semester. So anything that happened before that, that's your grade. That being said, I, I'm already, I saw, I was trying to get done, I'm already getting emails at People can have extensions on the homework that's due tonight, which is fine with me, but you just have to know on the 30th, 11.59, that's the end, that's the end, okay? So what do you have to get done? Well, you have to get the homework um, that was due, is due today, you have to finish that. And then uh, the first new thing is advice quiz, okay? So the advice quiz, I want you to take some time on it. I'm gonna give you extra credit for doing this, it's very valuable to me. Um, and I want you to write your advice to incoming students, people that are gonna take this class in the future. Um, this seems to be the delivery method for the incoming students. Okay? The incoming students of 23, 24, I think this is pretty much how they're gonna take the class at this point, that seems to be it. So they're gonna have the Pearson materials that you went through. They're gonna have pretty much the same experience you went through. Um, it'll be during no normal um, you know, fall and spring. So I imagine that they'll have classes in person as well as this course, but I wanna hear your advice. So I want you to uh, write that out for me. It doesn't have to be too long, but I will give you extra credit for doing it. So please, um, please do that. Okay, uh, let's take a preview of that. The advice quiz, some of you have already completed it. Uh, you've successfully completed a finite course and achieved exceptional 
exceptional results now that you've been tasked with sharing your knowledge and experience to help future students excel in their studies and be well prepared for exams. Write an essay outlining your top advice and study habits that you believe would greatly benefit them in the finite course. Support your recommendations and specific examples and strategies drawing from your personal experience and insights throughout the course. Tell them what you wish you would have done or what you successfully did from the top. That's what I want to hear from. And then uh, in the future courses, I will remove your name, which it doesn't tell me, you know, it's not going to have your name on it unless you write your name essay, which you don't need to do. Uh, I'll remove your name and then I'll give those to the incoming students. This is what people that finish your course that you're about to start said to do. And I can already tell, uh, I think three people have already submitted theirs. It seems to be you have to fight the procrastination. Like you have to be strict on yourself with scheduling, scheduling, scheduling. So I think that seems to be when I'm peeking at it, that seems to be um, the biggest technique of not, um, of doing well in this class is just schedule yourself. Don't wait till last day, okay? You gotta schedule out your own time. And that's, that's always the hard thing, um, especially in undergrad is figuring, figuring that out. Figuring that out for yourself. What else do we have? We're going to have a homework for the final exam. We're going to, that's what we're going to do in class today, is I'm going to show you. It's not as long as, as normal. The homework is a little bit shorter than a normal week would be. And it's just review. So you've seen these, this material before. It's just one more round to go through it, but it is required. And that's what we're going to go over in class. And it's fairly representative of what you'll see on the final exam. So that's what we're going to do today. You do have a quiz, and that's to prepare you for the final exam, and it is required. Um, so you need to do that. You'll have the final exam itself. I have much more to say about this. How many questions, time limits, I'm going to go through that, but you have to get that in. Okay. And then uh, is there anything else? Uh, submission work. Uh, I'd like you to submit scratch paper. You know, if you've got if you've got your scratch paper, if you've got your notes, I'd like to see it. Um, again, hoping to give as much partial credit to everyone as I possibly can. Um, so that's that's helpful. So you have a little bit of extra credit coming your way if you do that advice quiz, and I hope you will. Um, you have homework, a quiz, a finalism, and submit. So there's plenty to be done, got to get it done. Uh, but I, I know you can because you've been doing it. And it really isn't much more work than what you've been doing. Either. If you think of the final exam is really just like a time. When you get to the final exam, it's pretty much a time. How much time do you have? You have, I want to say 150 minutes, okay? which is pretty good. Um, my calc class, they get a little less time, okay? That's just, that's just the rules, okay? Uh, can I open a whiteboard with this new system? Maybe. Let's try share screen and whiteboard, I think. So, final exam. What do I want to say about the final exam? Uh, let's just go over the basic information. First, what is the password? All of this is going to be in an announcement uh, that comes out. But I'm saving the announcement for later because I'm going to put this video inside the announcement. So you could be watching this video inside that announcement talking about right now and that's very exciting but uh, i'll just go ahead and tell you in case you want to take the final today more than welcome i hope you'll do everything first in order but that's the password okay not easy to remember it's f capital s 22 final exam 
right? I think it's just based off of semester 22. So that's all going to be an announcement that comes out um, um, probably tonight. I have all this. I'll show you that. But that's the password. The time limit for the final exam, I think I already said, is 150 minutes. Okay. That's how long you have to take. Uh, it's, that's not too bad considering how many questions you have. You have 24 questions. And when we go over the homework for this week, when we go over week eight homework, that's like a longer final exam. And I, I think we'll even have extra time in class today. It's, it's not too long. There's certain questions that take a bunch of time, and those are the ones with the intervals. Those are the time consuming ones. I hope to show you some techniques to speed that up. I think a calculator can speed that up. Um, you know, and, and knowing that that's coming, there's going to be one question with intervals that's coming. You could save that to the end. Now, anyway, uh, I already said that it's due the 30th, 1159. It's a very weird night. Eastern Standard Time. So even if you're in California, it's still Eastern Standard Time. Even if you're in what? In Japan, whatever. It's still that that server is ticking. Okay, so you have to get it done with them. And you only get one that's so it's for keeps. Uh, that being said, I will do partial credit, just like I did for the midterm. So I'm gonna go through everybody's questions and everyone usually well, everyone has a unique. Like it ran just like your homework, randomized numbers, and that kind of thing. So it is time consuming to do that, but I'll flip through it to see. One thing I'm going to make sure is that it's grading you right, typos, that kind of thing. It's not possible. You write, you write it in decimals. It's supposed to be in fractions. It marks it wrong. That happened on the midterm, okay? Or, or, you know, vice versa, right? I, I can't remember which way it was, but I know that there was at least one question where you had to write it as a decimal. People wrote it in fraction of, maybe it was backwards. And the computer was marking everybody wrong. So I fixed it. You know, I mean, what's right is right. Or, you know, if, let's say it was just a straight line, y equals mx plus b, you got the slope right, but you get the y intercept wrong. Okay, well, I'll give you partial credit, that kind of thing. So that's that's to be expected. I will be looking over. The final exam. So when it, whenever you see that score, when you finish your final exam, that's the minimum score it'll be. If you get 100%, which I know um, there's going to be one of you that's going to get 100%. I don't want to embarrass them, but I know I think they're here right now. They're going to get 100% for sure. The rest of us are going to make a mistake. Okay, I'm going to make a mistake, but I'll give you partial credit on this. Mistake. So that's the minimum score you get. I'll go through it and give you partial credit. And then if you do that advice quiz, which I hope you will, it's just a short essay, advice for incoming students, what you would do differently or what you successfully did, um, I'll give you extra credit. Okay, and that should be, the extra credit could be a 3% you know, boost on your overall grade. So pretty big, pretty big boost, because I, I, I appreciate it, and I think uh, students learn from students better than they learn from teachers in the end. So if I say this is this is really what the students are saying, I'm just copy and pasting and protecting the innocent from re removing their names. You know, I I think they'll they'll believe that, and then they will also write their advice. And I'll have a nice database. Of, you know, this is what people are consistently saying, but. Um, that is final exam, password, time limit, questions, due date, number of attempts, uh, the material, what does it cover? So what is covered? Uh, it's really chapter seven to chapter 10, okay? That's, that's what's covered. So after midterm, after midterm is what's covered. All right. Again, we're going to go over the homework. 
but that's what you'll see on the homework is that it's just refreshing us of what was going on in the material after that. Um, so this is covered. I don't, I mean, I don't know about you. I personally don't think about the textbook when I'm even talking about this class. I think more of the homework, which is coming from the textbook, but I don't think of chapters in the book. Um, but it's chapter seven through 10 is what we're covering. But it's the homework from after midterm. That's what we're thinking. Okay, and then um, it's worth 30% of your overall grade. So you really want to knock this out. You want to get an A on this. You definitely want to get an A. Um, so, I mean, no one can afford to not. That's what I'm saying. But I don't think there should be any real surprise by the time you open that final exam what's going to be there. I don't, I don't think there'll be much surprise. Uh, Jack asked a good question in the chat. He says, are these questions in the homework reflective of the exact type of questions on the final exam? Or is it just, the, uh, I think it's I think it's pretty reflective of what you'll see on the final exam. So on exams, generally, there'll be at least one question that you've never seen before. Maybe one or two. Um, and this one, you have 24 questions. So I would expect to see about two or three questions You've never seen these before. You've never seen that story. Okay. Uh, Robert is playing baseball in the stadium. Okay. You've never seen that story before. There might be about three of those, two or three you've never seen before. Everything else would be something you've seen before. And a lot of that would just be straight from that review. I think the homework um, is pretty reflective what you're going to see. There shouldn't be too many surprises when you open up that. You know, when you open your final exam, there won't be much surprise what's behind you if you've done the homework. But that's that's a great question because I know what you're talking about. Um, and gosh, I've had I've had the absolute um, maximum range between you know math professor because I you know. When I was in school, it you know everything was just written by that professor, and so whoever you got varied of what kind of test you take, right? Unless it was a department exam, um, but you know, certain professors would they would make if they're you know if they're a tough one, if they like to punish their students for whatever reason. Uh, that was pretty reflective on their exams. Or, you know, I had other other professors where they would just make uh, exams look pretty much like the homework. I mean, this is from Pearson, so it's all coming from the Pearson homework, but I think it's, um, there won't be any surprises. But, you know, I've definitely had those classes where um, you, you sit down to take the final exam or the midterm exam, and you did not go over any of this homework or in class and everything is brand new and the teacher will say well you should be able to do it from everything you've done before had that it's not an enjoyable experience but that is not one you're going to have in this uh, but you will if you haven't had it before you will have it i mean you'll have that experience somewhere you just won't have it here um but yeah i have i had a quantum mechanics professor he, he did that on, on his exams. It was things you've never seen before, and he just felt you should be able to do it um, from what we've done in class. I found that I could do about half of them, which is not good enough. Um, so that, that can happen. Okay. But it won't happen to you in this class. All right. Uh, any other questions while we're just talking about the general exam itself? 24 questions, you have 150 minutes to do it. So, any questions? Any, any concerns? Yeah. It has a password. You, um, I didn't say it because it's just like the midterm. You can take it any time between now and then. Okay, so, once you open it, 
it's a clicking, you know, it's ticking down, right? Like a, like a Mario movie. It's just, you got a time limit, but it's whenever you want. So you don't have to schedule a time or anything like that. You don't have to schedule a proctor. It's just, once you open it, it's going to start ticking down. Okay? And that's, that's to ensure that you're taking it in one sitting, because that's, that's the idea. It's, it's to see what you, what you've learned. But I don't think there should be any real surprises once once you get there. Okay. Um, what else? Is there any other questions, comments, concerns about about the final exam before I get into the homework? To me, when I'm looking at this material and I'm thinking about what's tricky. I think, uh, so to me, the most annoying questions are the interval questions. Right, those are the ones I think are the most tedious and laborious to do. That's my opinion, um, but that's my opinion. That's what I think. If I was in your shoes, the thing I would worry the most about is maybe those just because they take so much time, but then also, the, you know, what's the probability that you draw at least five red marbles at uh, most nine brown crowns, that kind of thing. So that's something that if you don't even know where to start, you're doing it. Okay. So you have to, you have to practice, you have to get practice of knowing where to start. Those are, those are things that, um, you, you know, you just have to practice to get those. The other one, the interval, that kind of thing, those are time consuming, those are annoying, but each step is fairly easy to understand what you're doing. Okay, so for the intervals, I'm just finding the midpoint. Okay, that just means I'm adding and dividing by two. Each step's very easy. So, especially if you've done a few of those problems, it's very like just follow, follow the pattern. That, um, and even if they change the story or what you're, what you're, calculating about there's not much surprise of when you're actually done but the probability of um okay in this question i'd have to use permutation but in this one i'd have to use a combination oh here i'd have to use a Bernoulli here i would need to add the combinations or multiply the combination those are things that you just you have to get through practice 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 that's where it comes up okay and here's a general tip that you can take from me and maybe you can take it to wherever you're going in the future. Um, here's something I didn't do. My advice to you, uh, my advice to myself in the future, just because I solved a problem once doesn't mean I understand it, okay? That's something I did not do as a student very well, okay? If I solved it one, it might take me three times to solve it, but then once I solved it, I just moved on. Okay? I didn't look at it again. And that, that was something that I was really bad about as a student. If I got a bad quiz or something, I would shove it in my book bag and I'd never look at it again. Right? That's something I wish I could go back because looking back is really where the learning is going to come in. You know, finishing your homework is one thing, but looking back, that's when you're going to go, oh, okay, I see it. Yeah. So, do a problem more than once. That's and, and not just in this class, because maybe you're ace in this class and it's not that big a deal. But remember that for the future, especially the class where you're struggling. Okay? Do problems more than once. Doesn't doesn't need to be uh, math. It could be biology. It could be your um, you know. I mean, think about just reading a novel. If you read the book twice, think of all the things you pick up. I mean, we know that from TV shows or movies or something, if you watch something three or four times, you're picking up on things you never even saw the first time. And that's true with anything we do. Um, if you really want to you know, go crazy, you could do a problem 20 times, but I don't think you need to do that in this class. But you know, in the future, hold on to that idea. Look back on your work. Look back on your work. Though it can be painful, especially if it's a bad grade. And that's something um, that I wish I would have done uh, Maybe my ego held me back a little bit on that. So that, that's my advice to you and myself in the future.
okay? Because I'm still learning. So one day I hope to get it. You know what I mean? All right, what's this warning? Yes, I want to continue. Okay. Um... Will stop me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or I you think I made a mistake. And I'll I'll try to show you some calculator tricks and that kind of thing as we go along. All right, this says write the resulting set using a listing method. Now, what is even going on here? What is this symbol? That's the intersection symbol, okay? Upside down U is the intersection. What does the intersection mean? This is what they have in common, okay? The other symbol is the union symbol. And this is all elements, okay? Sometimes this is thought of as the word and, and this is often thought of as the word or. Okay, so if I wrote that in a sentence, I would say, what is this set and that set? Okay, it's what they have in common. So that's all you need to figure out is what they have in common. If it was the other way, if it was the union, it's all of the elements between them, but no repeats. Okay. All right. Well, for mine, what do they have in common? They just have the the number of zero in common. So there's not much, not much to be said there. It's just a zero. Okay. But in common, what they have in common. Is it possible that they could have nothing in common? Yeah, sure. I mean, you could have a set that's like one, two, three, intersect A, B, C. What do these have in common? You don't have anything in common. And that's the empty set. You can certainly have. Um, sets that have nothing in common. That's that's possible, and that was a choice. But, uh, for this example, it was not applicable. Right. Write the resulting set using the listed method. This is the union. Okay. So this means all elements. Right. Sometimes we say the word or. This is this set or that set. And in math and logic, or doesn't mean one or the other. It means both, okay, both. So we don't want to ever repeat elements. This is just a list, like an ingredient list. You don't, you don't write quantities, you just write the ingredients. So everything that's listed here will get counted. And it looks like one, and then I have four, and then I have five, and then I have nine. Does it matter if we list them in order? Does that matter? No, it doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter for a list. I think it's nice for the reader if you put it in order, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's the same list, like an ingredient list. If I put, um, if I'm, you know, writing the ingredients to a soda, they could put caffeine first, and corn syrup last. Okay, but they're both there. Okay. They're both there. You can put it first or last. It doesn't matter. It's just an ingredient list. Okay. So, and we don't write any repeats. Right? We look at this, okay, as far as the final exam, you know, what if somebody accidentally puts, um, you know, like a semicolon or a J or something like that in there, and they were supposed to put a comma. Well, that's where I'm going to come in make sure that it's counting it correctly. But I think for the most part, we understand unions and intersections. It's not too big a deal. But stop me if it is confusing. All right, this is the cardinality of set. Just a fancy way of saying the number in the set. And this says the number in A. Okay, so I have to visually look at this Venn diagram. I go, okay. It's just the number in A. That's it. But um, these 
you know, Venn diagrams, they can be a lot trickier than just this example. It's just those that are listed. Number is seven. Venn diagrams, worth practice, worth practice. You have to, have to remember how to do this. If you had A union B, or if you had an A intersect B, A complement intersect B, A intersect B complement, A complement intersect B complement, A complement union B complement. We got A intersect B complement. Yeah. Those are, I mean, there's a lot of things they could ask on that one question. Just by giving you a Venn diagram, they can ask it. So you have to know. Uh, in case you're interested, um, A complement intersect B complement. Even though this question doesn't ask, I'm going to go over it. In, okay. A complement intersect B complement. What is that? That's like B minus A. That's how I think about it. All right. Other textbooks, especially higher level math, I mean, it's not very hard to understand what's going on. It's just B minus A. It's the part of B that has nothing to do with A. That is very often asked because subtraction is really important. So if we're learning something like sets or Venn diagrams, you could imagine that addition and subtraction is important. Let's look at it going the other way. A intersect B complement. That's like A minus B. Very commonly asked. A minus B is this part. It's the part of A that has nothing to do with B. That's 22. In this example, could have been any number. What about, uh, let's go back up. What's A intersect B? What does A and B have in common? That's right here. So that's 48. That's not that big a deal, that's pretty common. Did we already do uh, A union B? Well, we know what A is. It's 70 plus 24. So A union B equals 70 plus 24. So that's 94. It's just everything encompassing A and B. Nothing overcounted. All right, what about... Switch colors. What about A complement intersect B complement? Where is that? It's listed, but where is it? My friend De Morgan of De Morgan's Law, he said if you want, you could rewrite this this way. That's A union B complement. That's pretty cool. So where is that? That's the outside. That's the outside. But A complement union B complement, where is that? Well, that's the one that gets everybody, including myself. A complement, where's A complement? So A complement is here and here, or the outside. Where's B complement? B complement is here and here. This is everything that's gotten shaded because it's the union, it's everything that was shaded. Does that make sense? Because it's union, it's not what they have in common, it's everything that has been shaded, which is everything but the intersection. It's everything but the intersection, which means it's A intersect B 
Like in one of You can just rewrite it. So it's everything but that 48. So it's the total minus the intersection. And then we already did this, the intersection complement. We already found that to be the same thing. Okay. So it's, it's good to practice these, understand where things are coming in. Uh, these, these come up all the time. So watch out for those. But any of those could be asked. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Refer to the Venn diagram to the right and find the indicated number of elements. What is the number of B intersect A complement? Okay, we just talked about that. Okay. That's like saying B minus A. What's B minus A? It's the part of B that has nothing to do with A. Now it has to be exactly this. If I flip this upside down and that's the union, that's different, okay? That would be a totally different thing. And that has really confused students in the past. So note that in general, the number of B intersect A complement is not the same thing as B union. A complement. Those are not the same things. You have to understand what each symbol is, what it means, and that those are not, in general, the same thing. There might be a specific example that you could find that would work, but in general, they are not the same thing. Right. So look out for that. Any questions about that? Does anyone want to see what B union A complement is? Is anyone, anyone interested? Or do I just move on? I can move on. Right. College offers two introductory courses in history, science, math, philosophy, English. If a student takes one course in each area during her first semester, how many course selections are possible? Okay. A few things I notice about this question. It's a how many question, okay? Read, uh, here's another tip. Read the questions out loud to yourself when you take the final exam. Read them out loud. Because if you read them out loud, it will slow you down to the point where at least you've read it once. That's another thing. That when we have to take tests all in the same room, we have to be silent. And that kind of puts a little extra pressure. If you're by yourself, you can read out loud. And that will at least slow you down and make sure that you've read every single word test. This is asking how many, not what's the probability. So be sure that you're answering the how many and not um, probability. How many? Um, one in each. Okay. So one in each, it seems like order wouldn't matter. I think we just want to pick one in each category. I don't think we care about um, if English was first, rather science being second, math being last. I don't think we care about that in our schedule. Just pick one from each group. If it's just pick one from each group, then that is exactly what a combination is. It's how many groups. Okay. So for my numbers, I have introductory course to history. I'm picking one. 
So that's two choose one. I have science class. That's four choose one. I have four science classes. I have one math class to choose from, three philosophy to choose from, and one English to choose from. Now, do I multiply? Do I add? Do I subtract? Do I divide? Do I take the logarithm? Do I take the exponent? What do I do with these groups? Do I multiply or add? Really is the question. Multiply or add? What do you say? I agree, it is multiply. So I'm going to multiply each of those. I would explain the reason why we need to multiply is because it's one schedule. This is one instance. If you have multiple schedules, multiple instances, that's where you add. You add across branches, you multiply going down branches. That's how I think of it. This is only one schedule. So I think this is two times four times one times three times one, because anything choose one is just itself. All right, well, what is that? That's four times three, which is 12 times two, which is 24. So that's 24, 24 different ways. If order doesn't matter. Now it says, if a part-time student can afford to take only one introductory course, how many selections are possible? Only one. Okay, so we offer an introductory course, history, science, math, philosophy, English. So the way I read it, we're only picking one. Choose one. Choose one out of what? Well, how many courses do I have? I have two history, four science, one math, three philosophy, one English. How many is that? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I think that's eleven choose one. What's eleven choose one? It's just eleven. So I think there's eleven different ways to choose that. Questions on that? Asking yourself, do I multiply or do I um, add? Seems It seems easy when somebody shows you. It can be very tricky if you don't know. Okay. Let's try this one, see where we get. Use the information given below to complete the table to the right. Okay, so we have B and A, B and A complement total, B complement A, B complement, A complement total, and then total A, total A complement, the total total. Okay, so they, in my version, they gave me A complement, they gave me B complement, A union B complement, and the universal set. Okay, so I need to fill this out. I'm going to fill out the given information the best I can, the best I can in the beginning. So let's see what I get. So I'm going to go over the Venn diagram, and see what happens. I only have two sets. If I can, I always fill out the intersection first. Okay, can I do that? They gave me. Write this in circles. A complement union B complement is the same thing as A intersect B complement. Okay. Hmm, I know the total. What's the total? The total is 98. That's nice. Okay. Well, let's see. 42. So everything but the intersection is 42. Doesn't help me too much. From here, I could find 
what A is, they say A complement equals 28. I know the universal set is 98. So A must equal the universe minus A complement. That's going to be true. That's just going to be 70, right? By the same logic, they told me B complement equals 33. The universal set equals 98. So B is just everything minus its complement. So 98 minus 33 gives me 65. All right, so now I know A, I know B, but I don't know the intersection. And that's the thing I really wish I did. I wish I knew their, um, their intersection, because if I knew that, then I would be done. I would almost be done. Okay. What can I do over here? So I have A union B complement. A complement, B complement. So I can find A, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I think from there, if I know A, B, and if I could figure out their union, then I could figure out their intersection. How can I figure out their union? I know what A is, I know what B is, I know what A intersect B complement is. That's here, here, and here. Let's see. That's there, no, that's there. I'm trying to think of the easiest way to explain this. I feel like I've made it worse. see hopefully everyone's version is at least somewhat similar so we know a complement has to be 28 so we got this number we know b complement is 33 we got this number we know what a is now 70 we know what b is 65 and I got my B here at 65, so we've got these down. Problem and 70. Okay. Now we need to think of A and B. Again, I'm trying to get that intersection from the given information. And A complement B, A and B complement. I think we do know because I know 42. We know 98. Okay, so we're getting closer. All right. What else do we need to know? B and A complement. So we need, we need to know B minus A, A minus B, A and B, and then the opposite. Okay, let's find that first. So 98 minus 42, what do we get? 56. So now we have 56 as our intersection. This was the complement of this, right? So 56. Does everyone see where I got 56? My version, they gave A complement union B complement. I've identified that as the complement of the intersection. I want the intersection. So I found the universe minus. A intersect B complement, which gives me 56, and that gives me that, and that gives me this. So from there, I can fill out what I have. I have B equals 65, I have A equals 70. Now I can find a union. Cool. So 70 plus 65 minus 56, 79. And now I know that. Now I can find what is 
a minus b, a minus b. So a is 70. Their intersection was 56. So I got 70, 56 is 14. Okay, now we want B minus A. So where's B, 65, 6, 9, okay. and then just the outside. We just need the outside. So we need A complement, B complement, let's switch colors. A complement, F7, B complement, which is the outside. So we can just do 98 minus 14 minus 56 minus 9. So I think the trickiest thing about this version was coming up with this idea because it wasn't explicitly given, but I really needed that intersection. And what they gave me was the complement of the intersection. So I was able to find it in the end, but it wasn't quite so straightforward. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns about this one? Is there any part of it you'd like to see again? That 14 down there. A, no, uh, this is oh, this is a fourteen. That's a nineteen. What's, what's the math? The green down there. The that's nineteen. Oh. Ninety-eight minus fourteen minus fifty-six minus nine is this nineteen. So I took the universal set and I subtracted this part of A, their intersection there and that part of B. Does it make sense? Is there any part you want to see again? I could probably do it quicker the second time if you want to see it again. How do you get 14? Uh, B complement. That's A minus B. Before that, right? A minus B was A minus their intersection. So I, I found they gave me A complement. So I found A. Then I want to find just this part. Once I found the intersection, then I can go A minus the intersection, which is just that part of A. I could do the, I'll do the whole problem again. If you want. Okay. All right. I saved the picture. So let's see it again. All right. Combinations. You know what's funny about combinations? With loss, you don't use combinations, it's all combinations. Maybe that's not funny at all, but um, it's true. Why don't you use combinations to solve common how many combinations? Because order matters. Here's here's my little story. So if I talk ATM codes, there's four numbers, or at least with my ATM and every ATM I've ever had, it's four numbers. And I have, to my knowledge, 10 choices for each one. So you'd have 10 choices. Well, let's write it like this. 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices. Assuming that 0, 0, 0, 0 is a choice and 9, 9, 9, 9 is a choice and everything in between, then you would have uh, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 choices for ATM code for that particular bank. And then they probably go by bank and 
other other codes as well. But order matters, right? So if I had, if my ATM code was one two three four, that's different than four three two one, even though those are the same digits. Order matters. Order matters. So when you talk about codes and that kind of thing, order matters. And since order matters, don't use a combination because combinations is order doesn't matter. All right, anyway, small combination lock on the suitcase has six wheels, each labeled with uh, 10 digits, zero through nine. How many six digit combinations are possible if no digits repeated? If digits can be repeated, if the successive digit must be different? Part A, the number of, also note, what is it we're solving for? The number of combinations, not the probability, the number of. So be sure you're answering not probability, and it's not asking for that, probability when it is asking for it. So the number of, of different six digit combinations possible if no digit can be repeated. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So for the first one, how many choices? Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay. So how many choices do I have on the first digit? Well, there's no rules about it starting with zero or nine or anything like that. So I'd say it's nine choices. I'm sorry, 10 choices. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Just going down the line. If no repeats. All right, let's see. 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. Okay. That's how many ways. How many ways can that happen with no repeats? Now, the second part says the number, if it can be repeated, can be repeated. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, can be repeated. So the first one I have 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices, 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 10 to the six. Part C, the number of different six digit combinations possible if successful digits must be different. Successive digits must be different. What is that successive digits? Okay, well, the first one, I would have 10 choices. The successive digit must be different. Okay, well, if, it, if the next one has to be different, then that's nine. Okay, now the next one has to be different than the one we just chose. Okay, we have 10 choices. The next one has to be different than the second. One. So the third has to be different than the second. That would only be nine choices. And similarly, the fourth one has to be different than the third one. So that's my choices. And we can kind of see where that's going. So this would be 10 times 9 to the fifth. Right? 9 to the fifth times 10. If you please, you could rewrite this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Could write that as n permutation six. That's the same thing. Or if you wanted to write that, you have your calculator. Calculate that for you. You could. Um, that's ten to the six. That's ten times nine to the fifth. But that's what ten permutation six means. Is that you're picking from ten. Each thing is going to be unique, and you have six slots to fill in. questions on that. The classic one is the ATM code, and that's the one that 
usually you start with understanding that okay, everything start with four, and then you would need to choose from. Other versions of the problem I've seen throughout the years are okay, well, what if the first digit couldn't be zero? What would you do then? So then the first one you have nine choices, ten choices for the others. That's the general idea. So even though it's combinations, not combinations. Don't use combinations because order matters. Right? Any questions, comments, or concerns about that one? All right. Well, this is super easy. If you use a calculator, let's let me use a calculator first. Know how easy this one to be. Um, and hopefully, my new Windows 11 computer is sharing that. Recording is on, so the account. Can you see? Share screen two. Can you see the calculator? Yes. So if you're using a calculator, they're all a little bit different. They all kind of get the same thing. I think I could go 15. It's here somewhere. It's a bad. We have our answer already. So I got one, three, six, five. Okay. So that's 15 choose four. Now, what if you wanted to do it by hand? Okay. So if you want to do that by hand, we have 15 factorial, 15 minus 4 factorial, 4 factorial. Okay. So 15 factorial, 15 minus 4 is 11 factorial, 4 factorial. Okay, so we have 15, 14, 13, 12. 11 factorial over 11 factorial, and then I'm going to expand the dice. Go. So 11 cancels. And then 4 times 3 is 12. So we can get rid of that. 2, I can turn that into 7. 13 times 7 times 13. Solve it by hand, or you can use the calculator to do that. Okay. And that's a combination. Any questions about that? And Zoe, you have you have a Texas Instruments with you, but I think it's a different button combination to get it. Right? Was it to get your combination there? Factorial button. Factorial button. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now, I will say, most of the time, I just use this little Casio for my arithmetic. I don't want to deal with the whole big graphic calculator. So um, this also has combinations, and I can do everything except graph. Um, but it's slightly different. Okay. Um, so make sure that whatever calculator you're using 
uh, you can find it before you start because that's, you know, if you're taking the test and you can use a calculator, I mean, JC might as well. So just be sure you can do it at some point. And I will say, you know, on YouTube, you can find it pretty quickly. Like if you, I mean, at this point, game of YouTube, you know, 14 years later, it seems like every brand of calculator, every operation, some short tutorial video for you to look up. So it might be something to look up before you start, just to be sure you can do it before you start the test. Permutations. So we just want to calculate six permutation three. I'll do it on the calculator first, and I'll do it by hand. So I think you can see my calculator. Let me go to the home screen. Clear. Okay, so let's go math. No, 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 sorry. Six math probability. And three. Okay, 100. Now with permutation, there's another way of thinking about that. That's like one, two, three, six times five times four, it's 120. That's one way to think about it as a multiplication principle. Another way to think about it is the formula itself. Six permutation three is six factorial over six minus three factorial. And then that doesn't have the additional factorial. So that's six factorial over three factorial. Six times five times four times three factorial over three factorial. I canceled it, and so we see we get the same thing. That's how you can do it by hand or on calculator. But gosh, don't you hope you'll get that as a final exam question? I mean, that's you know, you can solve that in seconds if you just convert it to use a calculator. Done. Maybe do it twice just to make sure you know you punch the right thing in. But I could, you know, I hope you get that question. Be nice. And a horse race, how many different finishes among three places are possible if 16 horses are running? Excluding tons. Many different finishes, three places, three places, three places. I would say that means there has to be a first, second, and third. So to me, when I think of a race, order matters. Like it's different than it's different getting third than first place. Super obvious, but with this kind of thing, you have to think about it. So I don't think I'm just making a group. I think it matters the order in which they fall. So if I have 16, and I think it's 16 times 15 times 14, which would also be the same thing as 16 permutation three, since we're excluding ties and only one person get one, or I'm sorry, one horse can get one position. So that's what it is. So 16 times 15 is 14. 3,360. Catering service, uh, service offers six appetizers, 12 main courses, seven desserts, a banquet. Committee is to select two appetizers, seven main courses, and five desserts. How many ways can this be done? Does the order matter? Does the order matter? So I have six appetizers. I'm supposed to select two. Does order matter? Well, yeah. I mean, you usually would serve appetizers first, but we're just picking a group. So I don't think it matters the order we pick it in. 
So I think this would be out of the six appetizers, I'm choosing two. Out of the 12 main courses, I'm choosing seven. And out of the seven desserts, I'm choosing five. Now, am I gonna multiply these or add these? Am I gonna multiply these combinations or add these combinations? And I think we're gonna multiply them. Why do I think we're gonna multiply them? Because this is the same instant, same menu. I think we need to multiply these combinations, right? Okay, so six, choose two, it's 15. 12, choose seven, 792 ways. Seven, choose five, it's 21. Okay, so 15 times 792 times 21. Two hundred forty-nine thousand four hundred eighty ways that could possibly. Why did I multiply? Because I think it's the same instance. It's the same menu. We're not doing different scenarios. If we're doing different scenarios, then we would add. That's what I think. That's problem eleven. We usually take our break now, so I think now is a good time. Thank you. I've had my voice for a while, so you can take a break from it. Uh, how about 15 minutes to come back and we'll finish this thing up? All right, 15 then. I'll be back then. I'll set a timer. I guess that would be 2 30.
Should be able to see this announcement now. So this is the announcement that's going to go out after we're done this meeting. It has the password there, time allowed, due date, number of questions, chapters in which it's covered. We have a final exam formula sheet. If you want to download that or print it off, um, those are all of the formulas there. We've used quite a bit of them uh, just so far in reviewing. We have you know, our combinations, permutations, if, it, if order matters, if order doesn't matter. The union formula we've just used. Uh, given probability we'll use later. Independent events. Expected value, we'll use that later on today. Um, odds for an event, odds against an event, Markov chains, initial states, first state. So this is, you know, if you want to use this, you can download it, use that, print it off. Use that. You also have your mean, ungrouped, standard deviation. Mean, if it's grouped, standard deviation. We'll talk about how to actually calculate these uh, beyond just the formulas and then the binomial distribution if you have a mean standard deviation it's binomial and then lastly the z score which is what um so a little formula sheet there for you if you want it um that's in the modules and i plucked it put it in announcements so you'd have that for yourself uh, additional assignments for this week of course we have the homework and we have a quiz um on um, one of the, maybe not the last two problems, but near the end, uh, I am going to pull up Excel, show you how we can speed things up as far as the homework goes um, in Excel. Um, so I'm going to, I already posted the Excel sheet in the announcement. The lecture videos, the screenshots I'm taking now. Um, my lecture notes that I'm using right now. Are posted so these are my notes that I'm using my little scratch work in case you want to see that um, and then these are just some bonus videos beyond um, uh, beyond the course if you're interested I thought it was really interesting uh, it's called string art it's a new uh, video uh, that just popped up on my YouTube within the past week and it talks about a lot of the things that that we're talking about with matrices and that sort of thing. Um, but the way what the actual video was about was how to take an image, condense it down to the you know highest contrast, and then they just made uh, the art image out of strings. So they have a um, a machine that can take a program and can actually put pieces of string on little binds here and it can make an image. And so you can see this question mark is formed with just strings. And then there's a, a bonus video within a bonus video. They have the proof of how they do that. And uh, that's a little bit beyond this class, but you could understand it if you have interest in it, um, of the AX minus B. It's kind of more of things we did in the first half of the class than the second half. Um, and if anyone, here is interested in, you know, the visual arts or uh, is interested in video games. I've been kind of thinking about um, how we can tie more interest of students into our courses here. And um, there's a lot of good videos about how they made some of the early 3D games uh, like Mario 64 or Doom. A lot of those, you know, were on the pioneer of math as far as computer games goes. And they needed um, some of those formulas for the light rays that reflect off the surface. They would have to come up with those vectors, and that's used a lot too. So, in case you're interested in that, maybe some of you are going to computer science or have interest in that, I thought I would throw that in. It's just a bonus video. It's just for fun. Uh, don't even look at it if you don't have time or whatever. It's just there if you want it, but we don't have time to go over it in class. I thought it was interesting, so I threw that up there. 
as well. Okay, and I, I think you could understand it if you watched it. Um, yeah, so that's that announce this announcement is coming out um, after class, but I need to post a, a few things that we're doing in class in there. Hopefully, it's sharing this problem. I think it is. Okay, so let's get started. Okay. Uh, did we already do this one? Yeah. I think we already did this problem. Okay, let's see what happens here. So a four-person grievance committee is to be selected out of two departments, A and B, with 13 and 30 people respectively. How many ways can the following committees be selected? Complete parts A through E below. So I will say committees are really just groups. Committees are groups. Okay. That means we don't care about position in the group. We just care that they're grouped up. Uh, in the older version of finite, like the older, older version, when I first started here, everything had to do with basketball. All the homework was basketball, basketball, basketball. And then, uh, there'd be some questions where it didn't matter about position in the team. It just mattered that they were on the team, and that's just a group. And that's the same with committees. It's just in a group. So we're just picking up groups. All right. Uh, we have uh, one group with thir 13 people and another group with 30 people. If we want 30 from group A and one from group B, how many ways can this happen? So I would say three from A, with my A I have 13 and my B I have 30. So that looks like it would be 13 choose three and then 30 choose one. So from there, we go 13 choose three. I got 286, and then that would be times 30. Eight thousand five hundred and eighty. All right. Change color so it's a little easier to follow. Two from A and two from B. So thirteen choose two is seventy-eight, and thirty choose two is four thirty-five. All from group A. Well, how many total do we have in A? How many total are we selecting? Four. So I think that would be 13 choose four. Four people regardless of department. All right. So how many people do we have? We have 43, 13, and 30 would make 43, choose four. 43, choose four. Kind of funny, one, two, three, four, one, zero. At least three from department A. Least, at least. At least means there's going to be more than one instance more than one occurrence so we know that we're going to have to do two at least more than one event right okay so that means we're probably going to have to string these together all right well what if we just get three from department a right well we already did that we already did three so we can do that again 13 choose three 30 choose one what if we did all from because the next one would be four, so that would be all of them. So that would be 13 choose four. Well, it turns out I already did all of these. I already have this one. That was my first answer. And I already have all of them. That was my third answer. So I can just add those together.
So I just add those together because I already calculated them previously. But you know, I could imagine that if it said at least three, but you were picking five or something, well, you'd have to keep going. But the way this one was phrased, it didn't have to. I could just add my answers together. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Let's keep going then. Okay. Cards. All right. Well, luckily we don't have a lot of card problems, but you do kind of have to remind yourself of cards a little bit, or maybe for the first time if you've never played cards, because it comes up. Right? So a card is drawn from a well shuffled deck. Of 52 cards, find the probability that a card is red or a two. Right. Probability of red or a two. All right, well, how many cards are red? Half of them are. Half of them are red. So I guess that would be 26. So I have 26 red cards. How many cards are twos? Four twos, because there's four suits. But two of those are red. So I only have two more. I haven't counted them. So all the red, that's 26. And then there's two black twos. It's confusing, but it's true. So I think it's 26, that's 28 over 52, 28 over 52, and we can just sub. So I get seven thirteens. Are you, you're looking at your homework now. Was that was your question similar? I was curious how yeah. how, how it was ran. It a black card or a five? Which is the same. Oh, that would be the same. Okay, I was I was wondering. Yeah, I was wondering how this was randomized. But I think did you get the exact same thing? No. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. So that should have been really helpful. Then expand the An experiment consists of dealing seven cards from a standard fifty-two card deck. What is the probability of being dealt seven hearts? Okay, hearts is a particular suit. How many cards are in the suit? Well, there's 52 cards and there's four suits. So there's 13 per suit. Okay. So there's 13 per suit. We're dealing seven cards total. To me, and we don't care the order, and we don't care what order these are dealt. We just care that we're being dealt seven hearts out of seven cards. So if I'm thinking about it right this afternoon, I think that would be 13 choose seven, because we don't care which heart card it is. We just care that it's a heart. We don't care what order it comes in. So just how many groups out of 13 cards can we make with seven? That would be 13 choose seven. And then how many groups of seven cards can we make out of 52? All right, so let's see what that turns out to be. 13 choose seven. It's 1,716. Okay, 15 choose seven. Ooh, that's a lot. All right. And they want it as a decimal rounded to six places. So I got to watch my rounding, but hopefully we can get it. Questions, comments, concerns, criticisms. 
when you did it in the calculator, did you uh, put it all as one? Thing? Oh, no, I did piece by piece. I did 13 choose seven. You can do it all as one, but I did 13 choose seven, found what that was. 52 choose seven, found what that was. And then just number over number. That's all. Did you have a similar question? Yeah. Was it still seven, seven? Five, five. Okay, but it's the same. So that was something that I was worried about. Fills are different, then it's quite a bit different. But I think that's okay. If you do seven cards and, or if you do five and five, it should be about the same. So with your numbers, I think that would be 13 choose five over 52 choose five. I mean, it's different numbers, but the same idea. If this was seven cards, five hearts, that's a different problem. That's a different problem, but that would be the same. I mean, different outcome, but same line. Good. 15. Suppose that eight female, seven male applicants have been successfully screened for five positions. If five positions are filled at random from the 15 finalists. What is the probability of selecting three females, two males, four females, one male, five females, or at least four females? When you see that at least four, you know, you're going to have multiple instances to deal with, okay? But let's see what happens. All right, I want to choose three and then two from the two groups, and I have eight female and seven male. Okay, so three females out of the eight, and I have seven males, and I am choosing two. And what is the probability? So that means we're choosing out of 15 people choose five. So here we go. Eight, choose three. 56. Seven, choose two. It's 21. 15, choose five. 7,003. 56 times 21. And they want this as a decimal. So that's what they show. Rounded to the nearest uh, third decimal place. So 0 0.352. Part B, the probability of selecting four females and one male. For my numbers, that would be eight. Choose four. Seven choose one over 15 choose five. Well, that's the same denominator, no problem there. Eight choose four, 70. Seven choose one is seven. 490. So 490 divided by three over three, three. 0 0.16. The probability of selecting five females, so all, all females here. I'm going to write seven choose zero just so you can see how that is. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. I just want to stay consistent and show you that you can write by how many you have. Seven choose zero is just one, so we're allowed to do that. Eight choose five is 56. Same denominator, 56 divided by 
denominator rounded to the third decimal place. And then the probability of selecting at least four females is approximately at least four. So we're going to five, right? We're going four to five. So that means I want to choose four and then I want to choose five. Well, I already did that. At least with the way my problem set up, I already did compute that. So I really just need to add those together. Any questions, comments, about what? Easy stuff. All right, what's the next one, Brandy? An experiment consists of drawing one card from a standard 52 card deck. Let E be the event of drawing two clubs. Find E complement. Okay, well, what is E complement? E is the opposite. Well, sometimes it's easier. I mean, sometimes it's easier just to go straight forward and then just take the complement of that, right? So we could find E complement by finding the probability of E. Uh, let me rewrite this. We could go one minus the probability of E. If we are easily able to find probability E, we can just take it as one. That would be the answer. Let's see what we can find. All right, the probability of drawing one card, and it's a two of clubs. So how many two of clubs are there? How many two of clubs are there? Two cards? How many two of clubs are there? One. Right. There's one of each suit, so I think there's only one. So that's one by fifty-two. Okay, that's one minus one over fifty-two. It's fifty-two over fifty-two minus fifty-two over minus one over fifty-two. Fifty-one fifty seconds. This wants to add a symbol. Shipment of 30 inexpensive digital watches, including eight that are defective, is sent to a department store. The receiving department selects 10 at random for testing, rejects the whole shipment if one or more in the sample are found defective. What is the probability that the shipment be rejected? Okay. Eight are defective. That's good to know. 30 watches. Okay, choose 10, and just one or more of the sample, it's the fact that it's rejected. So what is the probability it's rejected? What technique do I use? It's probably 17. We have 30 watches. I don't think order matters. I don't think that's something I could rule out. So I don't think I care what order the watches are coming in because it doesn't seem to matter. So I can rule out permutations. That's gone. Uh, so my next thought is, is it a Bernoulli 
or is it just combinations? That's my next slide. So Bernoulli is number of trials. So if this was a Bernoulli, I could see it being um, 10 would be the number of trials if it is a Bernoulli. I could think of it as that way, or maybe the number of trials is 30, but I don't think that's it. It says 10 at random for testing. So eight are defective out of 30. So what is that probability? So we have 30 watches. We have eight that are defective. And that's 22, right? So we have 22 that are non-defective. 22 out of what? 22 out of 30 that are not defective. What is that? 22 over 30? Love fifteens. What does thirty choose ten give us? So I don't think this is a Bernoulli problem because I don't think we're doing repetitive steps divided by 30 choose 10. So I'm just going to cut that off. And that's not the answer. That's the probability of getting a good working watch. What is the probability of it being rejected? That's what I'm being asked. So I think this is the probability of not being rejected. If this is not rejected, then rejected is the complement. The way I'm reading it, it's easier to find the probability of not being rejected and take it from one to go any other way. But that's just the way I read it. Uh, so I think it could go the other way, but let's go this way and see what happens. So that's 22, choose 10, divided by 30, choose 10, minus 1. Now they want us to write this as a decimal rounded to two decimal places. So that would be 0 0.98 round. Again, yeah, looking at this problem, it doesn't tell me how to solve it in any way. It doesn't say use this method or be sure to do this. I just kind of on my own. So I'll go through my bag of tricks. My bag of tricks are permutation, combinations, or Bernoulli. It's certainly not an interval. I'm not doing the mean, median, and low. That's clear. So what can you do? Well, I did think the order mattered. So permutation, I think, is pretty reasonably out. The only thing I had to think, is this going to be a Bernoulli or a combination? Instinct told me it's not a Bernoulli because I don't think I'm testing it one after the other, after the other, after the other. That's what the Bernoulli would do. This is just testing it as a group, okay? Just as a group. And that means it has to be combinations. So that's how I would do number seven. Any comments about that? I 
And then another thing was I found it easier to find it not being rejected since I found that was easier for me to think about. And I just took the compliment to find the probability it's rejected. That's how I did it. Independence, okay. What can I say about independence? The first thing I want to say, it's on the formula sheet, independent. Independent means that the probability of A intersect B is equivalent to the probability of A times the probability of B. That's the only thing it means, okay? That's either true or not true, true or false. Do not try to extrapolate from a word problem if something is independent or not. Don't go, this seems like it's independent, so it must be, or it doesn't seem like it's independent. You have to just see, is this formula true or false? So if they give you something like flipping a coin or picking a random car at the car dealership, the way to do it is to test to see if both of these both sides of the equation are equivalent. That's how you test for independent. Don't go any other way. Right? Find the probability of A and B or whatever that might be, and then the probability of A times the probability of B. Both sides of the equation have to equal each other if it's independent. That's either true or false. Now in this one, they just give us a chart. And it says, uh, test the pair events C and A for independence based on the following table. So we want C and A. I have C. I have A. Okay. So what's the probability of C? Looks like it's 0.2. What's the probability of A? Looks like it's 0.5 for my numbers. 5 times 2 is 10. So I guess that would be 10%. And then what's the probability of C and A? I don't see that they overlap. So for the way this table is set up, I don't think C and A overlap. So I think probability of A and C equals zero. But the probability of A times the probability of C is 0.5 times 0 0.2, and 2 times 5 is 10, so that's 0 0.5. And those are not equal to each other. So I don't think they're independent, the way this is set up. Independence is just whether or not this equation is equivalent to both sides. That's all it means. Really, when students get in trouble is when they try to extrapolate from a word problem. The chart, I don't think it's too bad. So it's kind of nice that that's the one we're asked about. But if, when, I, when I see other students and they have trouble, it has to do with interpret, interpreting the independence of a word problem. All right, two balls are drawn in succession out of a box containing four red, two white. Find the probability of at least one ball was red, given that the first ball was A replaced by the second ball, and then part B not replaced. Okay. Probability at least one red. Given. Replacement. Okay. Now we could get a red ball and we could get a white ball. That's at least one. We could get a white and then a red. Or we could get red and red. So this is with replacement. 
So we have four red out of six balls, and then we replace it. So we have six again, two white. Okay. Now you could get white first. That's two, six times four, six. Or you could just get both red. So that's four, six. Then we replace it. So it's four, six again. Eight, thirty-six, eight, thirty-six, sixteen, thirty-six, thirty-two, thirty-six, and they want these as a reduced fraction. Or B says not replaced. So once we draw it, we keep it. Even replaced. Well, I still think just replacing it and not replacing it, it's still get a red first and then a white, or a white and then a red, red, red. Those are the those are the options. So this is still four six, but we don't replace it. So now we have two of this. Or we could get a white first, that's two six, and then we could get a red, which would be four fifths. Four six for the first red, then three fifths for the second. So we're not replacing it. Right. So six times five is 30. Four times two is eight. And that's going to be the same thing, but in a different order. 12, 30. So, okay, let's put those together. 16, 12, 8, 30. Is. Got Any questions about replacement, not replacement? Given that this has occurred, does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns about that? So you're multiplying the two parts that are in the middle? Yeah, the so here I multiplied. Yes, multiply yeah. those together because those are the same ends. Red and then white. That's one option that could that can happen, or this can happen, or this can happen. Then I just add up different scenarios that could occur. Okay. It makes sense why I would multiply. Okay. Makes sense why I add because those are different scenarios yeah. that could occur. Okay. Good. Online folks, any questions? An urn contains two $1 bill, one $5 bill, one $10 bill. Player draws bills one at a time without replacement from the urn until a $10 bill is drawn. Then the game stops. All bills are kept by the player. Determine the probability of winning $17, the probability of winning all bills in the urn, and the probability of the game stopping at the second draw. All right, let's find the probability of 17. So how can that happen? Well, we stop when we get a $10 bill, but we want it to um, 
add up to $17. Now, I'm not, what do I have here? I have a 10, a 5, that's 15, 16, 17. So it looks like I have to get all of them for that to occur. So I could have a dollar, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. That's an option. I could have one, five, one, ten. Maybe I got the five first, then a one, then a one, then a ten. And I'm not going to worry about whether I got one, one versus the other one. That, that is necessary. Okay, so what's the probability? Is this without replacement? Yeah, okay. So we don't put it back in the jar. The probability of getting a one here, I have two. So that's two out of four bills. Then it's one out of three. And it's one out of two. And it's one out of one. Probability of getting the first one, two out of four. The five is one out of three. The second one is one out of two. And then the probability of getting that 10 is one out of one. And this would be one out of four. Two out of three. One out of two, one out of one. Let's multiply with n instances. Okay, let's take a look at this. So for the numerator, it looks like I have two times one times one times one, two times one times one times one. All right, looks like it's just two times one, four times three times two, four times three times two, four times three times two. Well, that's just 24. And it happens four times. I think that would do it. That kind of simplifies the math there a little bit. So that's just one four. Yeah. All right, now, what is the probability of winning all of the bills? Oh, I should change colors. What's the probability of winning all of the bills? Well, I think that's the same thing. I think winning all of them is what we just did. Because in the previous example, I got all of the bills out there. So I think that's the same as part A. Same answer. At least with my version. But see, what is the probability of the game stopping at the second draw? That is different. So that means that there's a 10 here. So I could have gotten a 1. Or I could have gotten a 5. Okay. So what do we have here? That's 2 out of 4, 1 out of 3. One out of four, one out of three. So that's two twelfths plus one twelfth, which is three twelfths, which is one fourth, which is a two five. Or one fourth, except in that. Now, I didn't care which one I drew. I didn't care which five. Well, there's only one, but I have to think of the orders that could possibly happen. Questions about that?
card is drawn from a standard 52 card deck. If the card is a king, you win $40. Otherwise, you lose a dollar. What is expected value of the game? All right. Do we have to pay to play for this game? Because that matters. I don't see it listed. So I don't, I don't see that we have to pay to play. A lot of the homework ones we did. I don't see that we have to this time. So I'm not going to. Okay, expected value. What we're going to do is we're just going to add up the value times the probability. Okay, we're just going to add those up. All right, so let's do that. Uh, what is the value of the first thing? It's 40 bucks. And what is the probability of winning that $40? If we get a king, how many kings are in the deck? Four. Four fifty seconds. If I lose, I lose a dollar. So that's like negative one dollar. And then what's the probability of losing? Well, that's not getting the king, right? So that's forty-eight out of the cards. Right, that should do it. Okay. So forty times four. And twelve or fifty two divided by fifty two. And it wants me to round to the nearest cent, so the hundredth place, two point one five. Makes sense. The premium for a $10,000 insurance policy against the theft of a painting is $200. If the empirical probability that the painting will be stolen is 1%, what is the expected return from the insurance company if you take out this insurance? Okay, so I think it costs to have the insurance. Looks like that's the cost. That's the probability getting the insurance. So be 99% you would not get that. Okay, I'm gonna do 10,000 minus 200. Because even if you get the 10,000, you paid 200, right? So what's the expected value? Even if you get the payout, you don't get the full amount because you had to pay 200 to play. There's a 1% chance of that occurred. The other option is that you pay $200. And the probability that that occurs is 99%. So there's a 99% chance you pay 200 bucks. No, no benefit to you. Oh, negative $100. In the past, I've had students that found it really confusing the winning amount, losing the pain, or sometimes it's a life insurance question. That means that something died, and that's the probability of winning the life insurance. So that, that can be confusing. Um, hopefully, it makes sense, though, the expected payout. 
the insurance policy. Thought we'd be done early today, but I'm either going slow or they're taking longer. So, I, don't know. I thought we were going to be done early, but I don't think we will. All right. Is there a unique way of filling in the missing probabilities of the transition diagram shown to the right? If so, complete the transition diagram and write the corresponding transition matrix. If not, explain why. So for me, I have. I, I would first look at A. So I have 0.4 going this way, 0.5 going this way. I have this missing piece, A to A, missing. They have to add to one, right? So question mark plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.5 equals one. Five and four make nine, so that has to be 10. So this equals 0 0.1. See what else we can find. All right, for part B, B, take that away. For B, we have B to B, that's fine. And we're missing B to C, we have B to A. Okay, so from B to B, two, B to A, three, that's um, five, three and two make five. So this has to be 0 0.5. B to C has to be 0 0.5. All right, let's look at C. C to C, I have 0.1. C to A, I have 0.6. C to B, I don't know. 6 and 1 make 7, so that would have to be 0 0.3. That's, they have to add to 1. They have to be normalized. Now, I think the next one, we just need to set up our Markov chain. So let's go over what these rows and entry mean. All right. The first entry is going to be A to A. Probability you're in A going to A. Then A to B is 0 0.4. And then A to C is 0. B to B is the dead center, 0.2. B to A was 0 0.3. And B to C is 0 0.5. That's one we have. Okay, and you make sure you're self consistent. Three and two make five, five and five make 10. Nice. All right, C to C is 0 0.1. Then C to B, we calculated as 0 0.3. And C to A is 0 0.6. 6 and 3 make 9 plus 1, 10. All right, here's my mark of G. Was that all of it? Was it two parts? Yeah. Questions on that? Easy stuff. Okay, um, da, 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 da. the transition matrix for a Markov chain is shown to the right. Oh, it's over here. Where is it? It's our Markov chain. Compute P squared. Well, I don't want to do that. It's just multiplying the matrix by itself, but I might as well just, if I can use a calculator, I'm going to. Especially for a red. All right, a little review of how to do matrices. Matrices. So let's go second matrix. Go to edit. Here, I'm going to enter a two by two. Six. Six. 
there I have my matrix A and A. Great. Cover the home screen. Select matrix. Select A. I'm going to multiply that by matrix A. There is my P squared. So I did A times A in the, in the calculator. That's A squared okay, by definition. Now, next, it wants P to the fourth. Well, that's what I just cal I just calculated A squared. So that would be A squared times A squared. So that's what I'm going to do in the calculator. I'm going to say A calculator. Take the previous answer and multiply the previous answer. There it is. So there's a to the fourth or p squared. It doesn't matter what letter. Just multiply it against itself. I can do this by hand. Since we're allowed calculators, I'm asked to show calculations. Now, the last one is p to the eighth. And I just did to the fourth. So I could take the previous answer here, previous answer times previous answer gives me to the eighth. So I just found to the fourth. Because the exponent's at, I just did that. So now I have to go over a little bit and see where that is. So I see here, that's fine. So I, need, I need to move over a little bit and see where that is. I looked at that, made sure I rounded correctly. No problem. Go down a little bit. And uh, select the correct answer below if necessary. Um, and it's asking, yes, Q is, what is the question? It's saying P to the K for two, four, eight. Can you identify the Q where matrices P to the K are approaching? Where is this going? What is this going towards? Just look at the first few entries. We have 0 0.34, 0 0.66. Multiply that by itself. Three, three, four, six repeating. And you can see there is a trend. And it's just three repeating, six repeating, three repeating, six repeating. So it's saying as this just keeps getting multiplied against itself, can you see that this is kind of leveling off? Yes, it is. So I just round it to the third decimal place like they told me to. And then that's my Q, where this thing is just kind of leveling. This is a normal Markov chain. Okay? Normal Markov chains, after they get multiplied many, 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 many times against each other, uh, themselves, multiplied against themselves, those values will just level off, level off. You can see where those are. If you're taking calculus, you can think of the limit, taking the limit to infinity, where these things level. You can do that by hand, or you can just calculate it. I chose to use the calculator. All right. Could the given matrix be a transition matrix of a regular Markov chain? In some ways, that's just asking if I multiply this Markov chain against itself many, many times, will I have all positive values? Well, I don't know. I'll have to see. I don't want to assume. I do have a zero here. So maybe, maybe not. So I don't know. I'm going to plug in my calculator and see what happens. Clear this. I go to matrix. Okay, I'll put it in B here. So I don't have anything in B already. That's fine. Put B here. That's two by two. Two rows, two columns. 50, 50. Zero. All right, 
So I'm going to multiply that against itself quite a few times and see what happens. So back to the home screen matrix B times matrix B. All positive values, that's what it's there. What happens if I do it again? Still, all positive values, everything, nothing's going to zero. Everything's positive, working good. Previous answer. Previous answer. I don't think anything's going to zero. So I think this is, yeah, this is a regular, regular Markov chain. All positive entries. Hopefully that's clear how I got that. Approximate the stationary matrix S for the transition matrix P by computing the powers of the transition matrix P. Okay, let's see what happens. I have the Markov chain here, cool. And they wanna know the stationary matrix, the stable vector. I'm just gonna call them X and Y. Multiply them by the Markov chain. So as this goes in the long term, what is the probability that we're either X or Y? Okay. All right, so if I multiply these out, what do I get? 0.5X plus 0.26Y equals X. 0.5x plus 0.74y equals y. Okay. I'm going to put everything to the left hand side. That way I can reduce and solve for x and y. So I have 1x to the right. If I subtract it on both sides, I get negative 0.5x plus 0.26y equals 0. So what I did there was I subtracted x on both sides in the first row there. For the second row, I'm going to subtract 1y on both sides, 0.5x minus 0.26y equals 0. Okay. Two equations, two unknowns. If I solve now, I'm not going to get any information because these are the same y. These are the same y. They're equal and opposite. Right? So if I added these together, I would just get 0 equals 0. No information is helpful. I need to normalize this. I need to tell the system that if you added X and Y, you would get 100%. I don't care if one is zero or the other is zero or both are zero, but I need them, if you add them together, I guess they both can't be zero. If you add them together, it has to be 100%. Something has to happen. So I can take these two equations now, plug in my calculator, reduce the matrix, and then find what x and y. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take this information and go 0 0.5, negative 0 0.26, 0, 1, 1, 1. And when I reduce this, I will get my x and y. Right? I do that. I get something that looks like one zero zero one, and it's going to tell me the answer. That's what I'm Okay. So, clear. Picture. Matrix. Edit. How about C? This is going to be two rows, three columns. Point five, negative point two six, zero, one, one, one. Right. Now I want the calculator to reduce this matrix, matrix M, reduce row echelon one, 
and then to reduce matrix main is matrix B. Now we have X and Y. So I don't remember how round to four decimal places. So I need a little bit. We'll further out the way. Cool. That's zero point three four two one. All right. There's my X and Y. Any questions, comment, or about how I got these? Any questions, comments, concerns? What is this? All right, we're getting closer. Mean, median, mode. All right, mean, just add them together and divide by how many numbers. Median, the middle number, these are already in order. And then mode is the most occurring. So I think we know how to do this. The only thing I wanna show, and I don't think I showed last time, is how to enter that in the calculator. So I think we could do this by hand. I want to show how we do it in calculator because I didn't last. I don't think I did. So I want to this time because this is the last time we'll be together. So I would go to this. I want to edit the list. Let's go in here. Set. Here I'm just doing choosing to use the calculator because I don't I did it last. One, two, three, four, five, 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 five. So I've entered in my list. Now I wanted to calculate a mean, 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 mean. I believe I know how to do this. Let's find that mean. Plug in list form. So list entered. Here is my mean. So the calculator can do it just as well as I can add all these and divide by how many. Mean. Maybe this one. 1.5, it can do that for me. Identify the mode. Well, we can just by inspection see it's the number one. Does it have the mode? Probably. I find it. Let's see that. So we just do something. I don't think I see mode. Well, do that second math. I want to from from mine. I do second stat. That has operation. So I don't. I don't see mode on this. I mean, I for this problem, it's very easy to see. So I I don't know if it can do it. I don't know. But we could clearly do this just by eye. Which one occurs the most? Well, note that you can have more than one mode. If it was a tie, you pick both of them. If it was a tie between three, you pick all three. Most occurring. Here's the worst. Now we're at the worst, finally. Intervals. And I think the worst of the worst is finding the median 
of the interval. That's probably the worst. I only have nine minutes to do this problem. So here's the question. It's probably gonna take me nine minutes to do it and I won't be able to do anything else. Do you want me to do the other problems or end with this problem? I need, I need your participation. What would you prefer to see? If I do this problem, that's probably the last problem we'll do, or I can do the other ones. This is just like the ones we did last week. Okay. Okay. I might be tempted to just point, this is just like the homework you're turning in today. Just like it. There's no tricks, nothing. Okay, what did I do? I'll just explain it really quickly. And then I'll move on. Find your midpoint. Take your midpoint and multiply it by your frequency. Okay, sum those up. And then divide by the sum of the frequency. That's your mean. Okay. The hard thing about the median is go, okay, well, what even is the middle? The middle is this interval, the, the distance times the frequency summed up. That tells you the area. Divide that by two, and you find where that is, okay? But we did all of that last week. I spent many, many, maybe an hour explaining it. So, and you just did it. So hopefully it wouldn't be too much review. Uh, let me go back to 29. 29 also, you find the mean and the standard deviation. So standard deviation we did, or you're still working on it probably, but this is just like the homework problem we did or that you're currently doing a tournament today. Okay, so standard deviation with intervals, those are the tricky ones. Those are the most time consuming, okay? So look back at uh, last week's material. You probably are, because you're probably still turning something in, right? So you don't have to worry about that. Here, not too bad. Now we just have numbers. So when we want to find standard deviation or mean, that's just the list. You can plug that list in your calculator and just have the calculator find it for you. You don't have to go any further. So I can just plug these numbers in and find it. It's only the intervals that are really in uh, So again, if I want to edit a list, I'll just delete this list. You can enter these in any order. Just it doesn't. Okay, now that I've entered the list, I have the calculator find. Is I have to find standard deviation. So the only thing that's really, really time consuming is those intervals, which I'm sure you know because you're turning it out homework now. So I'm sure you know about that. But if it's just just a list of numbers, not intervals, it's no problem. Okay. So I hope, hope that's okay, but that shouldn't be too much of a review. All right, let's do this problem. I might have to call it on this one. Fair die is rolled four times. What is the probability of obtaining at least three threes? All right, what, what's going on here? Am I going to use permutation, combination, or Bernoulli for this? It's rolled four times, at least three threes. So I think we could do a Bernoulli for this. Rolling it four times. What if I got at least three threes? What if I got exactly three? 
What's the probability of rolling a three? One out of six. What's the probability of nine? Five out of six. Three and one. Now I'm rolling it four times, so I could get all threes. What's, so four is how many times you're rolling it. Choose three. Because they said at least three. It would have made more sense if they picked any other number. Yeah. Like, why couldn't they have picked a five? Because as you can see, but um, it doesn't matter what number it is. It's just that they pick a number. So what if it was a five? What's the probability of obtaining at least three fives? Well, the probability of a five is one out of six. Probability of not five, it's five out of six. Rolling it four times and at least three, so that's exactly three. And that's all because you have to go, if it's at least, then you have to go all the way up to all of them. For this, it was only one step. And the numbers on the outside of the parentheses, that's not to the power of, is it? This, the four? Yeah. Yeah, that's one six to the four. Oh. Five, six to the zero, which is just one. This is just one, but I was right at four. Kind of caught me a little bit there. All right, four choose three is just four. One third, one six to the third times five, six. And four choose four is one. One six to the fourth. Just together. And they went at two, three decimal places, so 0 0.016. Okay. I don't think I could do a problem in a minute, but I could probably talk about it. If the probability of a new employee in the fast food chain is still being in the company is 0 0.6, what is the probability that eight? Newly hired people, five still will be with the company after one year. Five will still be. That reads to me like a Bernoulli because you're told the probability so you can find the complement, which would be 40% with these numbers. And that would be eight out of five. So like eight choose five. And then uh, eight choose five, eight choose six, eight choose seven, eight choose eight. So I think that's a Bernoulli. And this is the last problem. This was part of the previous homework. I think it's just different numbers, the same idea. Uh, they tell you the mean, the standard deviation, you find the area. So you're probably still getting it now. So you're probably up to speed on that. Last problem, binomial 800. So this is finding the mean, median, no, uh, the mean, and the standard deviation with given trials, probability of success. So that's using the mean equals N P and standard deviation is square root of N D Q. And from there, find on the Z table, X minus mu over the standard deviation. Now, this is all stuff we did last week, so it should and you'll probably still turn it in, so it's probably relatively fresh in your mind. But that would be included. If it was me, I'd probably save the intervals to the last just to make sure I have enough time. I would get as much done. Standard test techniques do one you absolutely know, and there's no question in your mind first. And that's um, standard uh, test taking ability. Make sure you do all the homework first before you take the final exam, because I think once you do this, there will be very little surprise. Actually, um, I'm still your teacher until Sunday, so feel free to 
reach out if you have questions and I'll try to respond the best I can this weekend. I'll do the best I can. I know you'll be working on it. I'm over on time. I wish you well. I hope it wasn't too bad for you. I know taking finite over the summer is probably not your idea of fun, but hopefully it was okay. Uh, let me know if you get stuck. I would prefer you just email me unless you have a question on the homework then just hit ask my instructor and that's the best way for me to see what you're looking for. Well, I wish you well. Good luck on your future studies. And I'll post this video later today. I'll stick around for any questions, but that's it.